Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of About Abroad, where it's my job to introduce you to people who have built amazing lives for themselves in various foreign corners of the globe. We're talking with expats and thought leaders about moving abroad, remote work, visas, and all the fun and practical knowledge that you need to know to follow in their footsteps. If you've ever dreamed of making a life for yourself overseas, maybe working remotely or embracing long-term travel, retiring or studying abroad, or even just taking a peek inside life beyond your borders, you've landed in the right place. As we all know, modern teams require modern solutions, and a pain point for many distributed teams for many years has been related to things like company credit cards, budgeting, and expense tracking. But this has all been solved by the team over at Ramp. With Ramp, I can issue virtual or physical company credit cards for anyone on my team in just a few clicks. I can actually assign those individual cards their particular limits and rules and track expenditures seamlessly all in the Ramp system. You can assign as many cards as you'd like, pay for transactions around the world in multiple currencies and manage your budget all in one place. I really do think Ramp might be my favorite new tool to emerge in the past few years, and I have no idea how I'd work without it anymore. Create an account in minutes and get a free $500 Ramp bonus when you spend your first $1,000 via the About Abroad affiliate link in the show notes. My guest today is my good friend Anthony Cavalese, who joins me for a rare in-person interview here in Italy. About a year and a half ago, he joined me here on About Abroad to talk about the process that he was going through, which is called citizenship by descent. He is moving from the U.S. to Italy to try and obtain a Italian passport. Now, fast forward to today, he has gotten that passport and he's actually helping other people go through the same otherwise painful process that it can be to, to go about getting one of these. So we shared a lot about what he's experienced. We also talked about some of his favorite places in and around Italy and some of our shared travel experiences from around Europe. This was a lot of fun. We really enjoyed catching up and going over some of the practical information that's needed, but also just talking through some of the pros and cons of living abroad. There's a lot of really good info for here, so I hope you enjoy. Please help me in welcoming Anthony back to About Abroad. Dude, so good to see you again, man. This this time uh, actually in real life, which is pretty awesome. And literally, I believe it's the first time yeah. that I've ever done this. This is incredible. <laughs> and I just like to take a moment to look out the window and see like where we are. This is amazing. It's so beautiful here. It's epic. It's not what you think of. Uh, when you think of Italy, right? No, like this no. isn't this isn't the stereotypical scene. I think people, when you know, when I was growing up, dreaming of coming to visit a place like Italy. I mean, it's up there at the top of the bucket list. Uh, I thought about Rome. I thought about you know Venice. I thought about that like uh, Mediterranean architecture. Sure. And here we are. I mean, people, you know, for those listening, like we're sitting up here in the Italian Alps looking out at what might as well be Austria or Switzerland. Yeah. <laughs> and if you look at the food, you would think the same. If yeah. you didn't hear people talking and see the language of the signs, you might think we're in Austria or Switzerland or Southern Germany. It's so cool. It's <laughs> so nobody cool. nobody lounging on the beaches in Speedos and like people <laughs> flinging pizzas everywhere. And <laughs> Slightly different. We're, we're very far away from, from Sicily. Actually, it's funny. The other day I, uh, I mentioned Sicily because I met a couple – um, that had just driven from Sicily all the way up here. They did this every year. They live down in the south side of Sicily. And they're probably a couple in their like Italian couple in their 60s. And they do this road trip every year all the way up here to to the north, to the Dolomites in that area. And just to like enjoy and appreciate the, their country and the diversity that they have. Yeah. Just for them, and I guess that's the equivalent of doing like the Route 66 in the U.S. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's it's wild what you can experience, and you know, in in Europe as a whole. But I mean, in this in this country, I think the 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 diversity. It, in my mind, I don't know. I'm just shooting off the cuff here, but like, I think it's the most, perhaps the most diverse country. It in, is in incredible. Europe. It's mind blowing, and and. I like to bring up numbers because I'm an engineer, but like Italy is 75% the size of California by land mass. And now that you spent some time here, you can see that is insane considering the diversity of the food, the diversity of the language, the fact that people, you know, in the South don't understand the people from the North. I mean, it's like, it's just hyper localized, hyper regionalized. Everything is insane. It is not anything I knew before moving here. It's, it's incredible. How long have you been here now? 
So I moved, I made the leap in March of 2022. Okay. I spent most of that time here with some time back in the States to see family for holidays and a little bit of time in other European countries. But Italy has been my, my home base for almost two years now. That's, uh, that's, I mean, it really is one of those places where I feel like if you have the chance, come spend some time here, whether that be for a week on vacation or if you're lucky enough to have the flexibility to do a month or something. But like, if you can really soak it in like you've done, um, I mean, I've only been here, I've been here a few months now and, and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I'm loving diving deeper on the language and the culture and unfortunately too much the food uh, <laughs> for my waistline. But, you know, uh, that's a, that's another thing. Um, but like, you know, if I, I, I could see how this could be a place where, you know, you, you could settle down and just live a very fulfilling life. Yeah, I, I could totally see that. And it's, Again, you could just travel and you could spend five lifetimes traveling the country and learning something new every day with all the, all the variation and all the, you know, in Sicily, there's all the influence from the past, from the previous invasions of the you know, Arabian invasions. And, and then up here in the north, it's like we're basically in Austria and, and everything in between. It's, it's, and then Sardinia, the island where they, you know, they don't consider themselves part of Italy and all that. It's, it's really incredible. So cool. That's so cool. I didn't know that about this area. For example, like... I guess so I'm probably am butchering it, but they call it like the Alto Aldige. Yeah. This region up here in the north that like actually was part of Austria up mm-hmm. until World War One, until yeah. after World War One. And so like, you know, when I'm walking around sometimes, I mean, you see people in the like traditional, like kind of Bavarian style outfits and right. you hear people speaking German a lot. Um, like I've walked into a restaurant and been like just totally talked to in German. And, wow. uh, and yeah, and it's like, it's like, am I, am I in the right place? Particularly as you, I mean, the closer you get to Austria, that becomes like the norm, not mm-hmm. the, not that, that, you know, it kind of becomes the default. And, uh, I just didn't know that. I, yeah. I just, I had, I had no idea, but I'm really fascinated by these areas that have traded borders multiple times over the years. Right. Like, uh, in Catalonia, it's that way in France and in Spain. Yeah where you have people that identify, they live in France, but maybe they identify as Catalonian, right. for example. And, and, you know, you have that here. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. It, it makes the, it makes every day fun. Like yeah. you get to experience these things on a daily basis. Yeah. I, I, I was, um, my sister and I were at Lake Garda a few months ago and we met a family, a younger, younger couple with some younger kids. And the couple was from Bolzano, which is maybe 30, 45 minutes North of here. So yeah. Closer to Austria. And the kids were, you know, really chatty and stuff. And the kid said something to me and I responded in Italian, but he didn't understand me. And I said, but he didn't understand me. And the parents said, oh, they, they don't know Italian. They're learning German in school, which <laughs> was like mind blowing to me. Yeah. Because, and I didn't get into the details, but I'm assuming maybe it's a cultural pride. Maybe they have some Austrian heritage. Maybe they see the kids will have a more opportunities growing up, but they speak German instead of Italian, which mm-hmm. is probably true. Yeah. Employment wise. Um, but yeah, it's it's crazy. And then to the to the Catalonia thing, I was in Barcelona last year, or earlier. What year is it? Yeah, last year. Jeez. Now we've crossed into twenty twenty four. It's really confusing. <laughs> yeah, um, I know. I was there with a, an old colleague of mine and friend who was visiting there. He's from uh, a town outside of Barcelona called uh, Igualada, uh-huh. and we were in this small little town. And this was like his hometown that where he grew up. And we read a bar again, served some beers, and the waiter came over, and the waiter spoke to us in Spanish, and then so we ordered in Spanish, and then the waiter walked away, and my friend was just pissed off. He's like, "This asshole spoke to us in Spanish. Does any other supposed to speak Catalan here?" And his wife was like, "Mark, calm down." And so he's like, "No, if you're gonna live here, you're gonna speak Catalan. You don't speak Spanish." He was, wow. I was like, "This is insane." Yeah, I know. I think I think for people on the outside, they think that like. Oh, that's a cute little thing that, you know, people like that whole Catalonian Spanish thing is just a it's there, but it's not a real thing day to day unless maybe you're like an extremist. But I've had those conversations, too, where they're like, no, even even to a lesser degree in Valencia, they have Valenciano. And I've been in groups where they've said that, too. And it's like it's it's way much, much to a lesser degree in Valencia. People aren't as extreme about it. But I have had those conversations where it's Mm -hmm. like, you know, we are in Valencia. We should they should be speaking Valenciano. And you're like. Really? Should yeah. they? But yeah. but yeah, people have uh, you know ties to their heritage, and and people in Catalonia will tell you like Catalonia was around before Spain was around. Like yeah. 
we have a we have a right to this and yes it's fascinating <laughs> <laughs> i love this stuff well hey so okay um i know we could both go down that road for a long time um but for the audience's sake i would love to there's a lot of things we want to get into because a lot's changed yeah. um evolved since we spoke last time and there is going to be a link in the show notes to our previous conversation so for anyone who really wants to dive deep on your story, um, they can they can go and listen to that episode. But let's give them the the quick kind of like elevator pitch sure. on where you're from, where you live now, how you kind of came to be here, and uh, and generally speaking, like what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah. So last time we spoke was summer last year or summer 2022, so about a year and a half ago, and a lot has changed. So I'm from just outside of Atlanta, Georgia, in the U.S. Mm. And at the beginning of 2022, I decided to kind of just take a leap and I never lived outside of my hometown more or less. So I just wanted to do something different. Um, And I learned that I was eligible to get Italian citizenship and traveled to Italy for the first time, mostly as a vacation, but also with a side mission to kind of like explore the town my ancestors came from and get some of the documents that would be necessary to start this process. If I wanted to take it seriously, my cousin and I, my cousin and I did this together. And I just, like everybody, I fell in love with Italy and I learned that, okay, I could do the process of getting my citizenship faster by establishing residency in Italy, um, which we've talked a lot about on the last show, so I don't need to rehash all that. But basically it said, all the signs pointed to go to Italy, try, try something new. The idea was basically a year, a gap year. So I, I quit my job, sold my house. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> All those things I was working towards, uh, we'll just throw them out the window. <laughs> yeah, that picket fence will come one day, I guess. Um, so I spent, when we spoke, I was about seven months into that. Um, and shortly after that, I basically realized, okay, this life of living abroad and the, the freedom that comes with it, that came with my situation, um, was very enthralling and intriguing and addicting and I was like I want to see if I could keep this going and I just you know I developed this passion for Italy travel I traveled to all 20 Italian regions and just got to dive deep and um, obviously because I did the Italian citizenship process myself I started kind of helping people do that on their own Mm. Um, so now fast forward to now what I have are two businesses one of which is Quasi Italiano which if you go to quasitaliano.com or italytravelhelp.com, which is much easier to type. <laughs> I learned that branding matters a lot, and it's good to have an easy-to-access domain. <laughs> they didn't teach you that in engineering school? They didn't teach us that in engineering. <laughs> it's like, damn it. Um, and that focuses on Italy travel. Basically, I write a bunch of articles about like culture in Italy and travel tips for Italy and specific recommendations for the cities, and I'm slowly building that catalog because I have, I'm sitting on a lot of material. Mm. And it's, you know, it's a lot of work to publish all that. And then I do a lot of stuff on Instagram related to that. That's one business. The other business is Become Italiani. And that I have a business partner, Christina, and we help other people get their Italian citizenship through the Italian citizenship through descent process. So most of our clients live in the U.S. They're, you know, we cater to American citizens because that's a side of the process that we know. So we basically help people with the getting all the documents that they need to fulfill the requirements of the Italian government to get their citizenship through descent. And most of our clients are applying through consulates in the U.S., so not the route that I took, which is through Italy, although we do have a couple that are doing that, actually, right now as we speak. Okay. Um, so it's it's a total uh, change from where I was before, which is, you know, it was just going to be, it really was just going to be a year off and enjoy it and then, you know, go back to engineering life. And I'm still going to keep that in my back pocket. I'm not going to let my license expire and all that, but... Um, I love what I'm doing now. I love helping people. We, Christian and I, I think we make a really great team and we just love, we kind of have like a family approach with people where we like to, we do video calls with all of our clients mm-hmm. before they come on as clients because we want to meet them. We want them to meet us because, you know, we're going to be working together. We're going to be in your lives for a while. It's a long process. So we want to make sure that people can get a feel for us. So I like, we like bringing the personal side to things and it's 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 been really interesting i've learned a lot along the way in terms of you know starting your own business and that sort of thing and um and it's just any way i can still be attached to italy culturally linguistically and and helping people out and and with the travel side of things helping people enjoy their vacations in italy i get a lot of fulfillment out of that 
I can relate to you on on so many subjects there. I mean, I I also do some like consulting, I guess I'd call it in this space, not particularly for any one program or visa or something like that. But, um, you know, when people reach out and they say, you know, hey, I'm trying to essentially in some way or another do what you've done, uh, move abroad, spend a year there, change my whole life up and just completely uh, immigrate to another country, whatever it may be. And, you know, I just I'm not sure where to start. Mm. Um, could you give me some guidance? I think like you, uh, we can you know, we can relate on this. Like it, when you're when you are just getting started in this, it's very overwhelming. There's yes. a lot that you don't know and you don't even know the right questions to ask. A lot of times you just maybe you don't even have a place that you want to go. You're just like, I just want to go do this. Um, and and so there's so many moving parts and just to have someone to guide you through the process on any level is is extremely helpful. I've found even just having conversations. I did that when when I started moving abroad. I just started reaching out to people who were doing it like, can I just pick your brain for a little bit? Um, yeah. You know, I'm happy to pay you for your time, uh, whatever it may be. But, you know, I just just need to know even just the right questions to ask. And then I think when you get into any sort of a like very formal visa or certainly citizenship by descent. Am I saying it right? Is it citizenship by descent? Yeah. yeah. Citizenship by descent program. Um, that's going to get bureaucratic and technical and heavy quickly. And if you don't have someone that's walked down that path, uh, I think you're going to be slamming your head against a wall <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> quite a bit. Yeah. And there, there are a lot of companies that help with this kind of thing. And basically the idea is... Um, you you look at the list of requirements for what's required for for citizenship by descent, and it's daunting. It's overwhelming, especially if you've never seen it before, like uh, an apostille. I don't even know what that word means, and it's yeah. like all this stuff. And and a lot of people do the DIY route, but specifically, a lot of people start the DIY route and they get burned out and yeah. they get overwhelmed. And like I'll get to this, and then the years pass and nothing changes. And I hate to see that because it is. I mean, it's this opportunity that. We are insanely lucky for those of us to have Italian ancestry to qualify for this. I mean, it's it's like an opportunity. It's, if you have any interest at all in living abroad or have any interest in your kids living abroad one day or, you know, the benefits that come with that, why not get the gears in motion and get it moving? And that's, you know, that's what we offer. And, and I think we do a really good job at And just having somebody that can take the headache for you, that's the big <laughs> thing. Keep it moving. Because I remember when I did it, it's like I had to do something every day. Yeah. Every single day, what task, what thing am I going to mail out to move the process forward? So we like people to not have to worry about that. We just, you know, we help them out. Is it is it uh, correct to say then, I mean, you, you already answered this, but just to sort of clarify, like, so what you did was you quit your job, sold your house, moved your whole life to Italy and spent a year mm -hmm. working on this from Italy. Um, not everyone has to do that, correct? Correct. Not everybody has to do it. And in fact, I did it. And from when I arrived in Italy to when I was recognized as a citizen, um, it was about four months. And I did, I, when I say I did a DIY, I should clarify, I did not do a DIY in Italy. I used a service provider to help me with that. And we talked more in detail about that before. Okay. So that timeline was helped a lot by having somebody on the ground here in Italy with me. Um, but I started the process of getting all the documents myself in Italy, uh, in the U.S., I'm sorry, six or seven months before. No, you do not have to do that. You can apply in a consulate in the United States or you know, for other people listening in other countries, you would apply in the Italian consulate in your country. And the process does take longer because consulate wait times are quite long and that's a problem that they're working through. But in general, it's it's easier and it's cheaper and that you don't have to uproot your life and move to Italy, but it just takes more time. Yeah. And the rules are a little bit different and there's nuances and how the rules can be different. But I tell people, it's like, okay, if, if they're going to be like where I'm from, which is Atlanta, they would apply for the Miami consulate. Mm. To get an appointment in Miami, we like to tell people up front, Miami appointments are three years out. Whoa. Yes, which is kind of the <laughs> middle in terms of a lot of the consulates. Like San Francisco is a little bit of a mess right now, and they're looking at five plus years. Oh and like God. Houston and LA have got it down to like a few months somehow. Don't know how they figure that out. But anyway, I tell people like... Look, okay, so it's going to have the appointment in three years, and then you submit your paperwork, you're going to have to wait probably another year and a half for them to get back to you. So let's call it four and a half, maybe five years. It's a long time, but if you're 40, five years is going to pass no matter what. So mm -hmm. would you rather be 45 and be an Italian citizen with a passport or not? 
There you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess when you put it like that. <laughs> is there any kind of a, like once you've applied and you're like, you know, you're in the process, like is there any kind of like temporary status that you get? Um, or is it just like, no, you're, you're waiting that full time? Unfortunately, you're just waiting. The yeah. only temporary status you get would be if you did apply in Italy. And while you're waiting, you get a, a special um, visa called a permesso di soggiorno in testa di cittadinanza, which says you're waiting for this process so you can legally be in the country more than 90 days. Okay. Um, but that's specifically for people applying in Italy. And you don't, actually, you don't actually get the visa. You get the paper that says you have an appointment to go get the visa mm-hmm. in like nine months. But just that paper is going to... It's like, good if enough. If the police ask you, it's like, I have an appointment. I have an appointment. It's yeah. in 2028. Uh, <laughs> but in terms of people applying in the U.S., no, you don't get a special permit okay. to then... You know, you couldn't move to Italy ahead of time. You yeah. have to wait until you've got that citizenship. I wonder if it would be worth it uh, for someone who kind of wanted to get the ball rolling. Like, would it make sense to to come to Italy and do like, you know, set aside a month for yourself or whatever time frame you think would be necessary to like just get the ball rolling in Italy and get that paper. So then you could come spend more time here if you wanted to. Um, you you could do that. You would have to have all of your paperwork ready yeah. to submit. So we're talking basically a binder full of all the birth, marriage, and death certificates needed. Everything translated to Italian certified. All the documentation proving that your Italian ancestor didn't, you know, the naturalization for their citizenship to show that you qualify. That has to all be ready. So then in a theory, yes, you could go to Italy and apply and get that special permesso. But... The apply in Italy route is for people who live in Italy. So mm. the comune, the, the town hall where you live is not really going to like it if you show up and submit your stuff and get your permesso and then leave. Yeah, so like, got it. Okay, do you live here or do you not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. You're like, well, I want to. Will you let me? Right, right. <laughs> that's, that's why I'm here, dude. Um, uh, it's interesting. Yeah, I found that with a lot of um, the digital nomad visas are similar. Like it, it depends country to country, but um, they have this thing like that where you can, like in Greece, for example, you go and you show up and you want to apply for the digital nomad visa, but you only have 90 days technically on your visitor's mm-hmm. visa, your tourist visa. Um, once you apply, just by applying for the digital nomad visa, you automatically get a one year residency permit. Oh. Um, which which is one of the main reasons why like I think the Greece digital nomad visa is one of I the best you in the world. This in one of your Q and A's the other day, I think. Yeah, it's really it's really streamlined in that way. And like you know, like a lot of countries, they have long waiting lines for the actual visa. So I mean, you do have like in some cases, people are like, yeah, I'm waiting for you know a year, year and a half for my visa, but I'm allowed to be here sure. and travel around the Schengen sure. while I'm while I'm waiting on it. So it's like it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. But that's very cool. And I, I, we sort of jumped the gun because we know this program a little bit. But for anybody that hasn't heard our previous episode or maybe hasn't even heard of Citizenship by Descent, like, can you give a, a quick overview of, of what this is? Sure. So Citizenship by Descent, it goes by the Latin term Jure Sanguini, which has 16 different pronunciations. And I didn't take <laughs> Latin, so don't ask me. But basically, it says that if you have a Italian citizen in your ancestry that was a registered Italian citizen, meaning they were born in Italy and their birth has registered somewhere in Italy, and it was after 1861, which has been Italy unified as a nation. Prior to that, there was no such thing as an Italian citizen. So, for example, in my case, it was my great-grandfather. He was born in 1898, um, and I had the documents to prove that, and I also had the documents to prove that when he came over to the U.S., he did not naturalize as a U.S. citizen before my grandfather was born. Okay. So what it says, by law, the law states that citizenship is passed on through birth, specifically through the male. Mm. And we can get into why it says male and how that's changed a bit, but and we did on the last episode. Um, but basically, if you prove that you're connected to this ancestor by getting all those documents I mentioned before, the citizenship is passed on from one person to the next as long as they are still an Italian citizen when they have a kid. So if you naturalize as a U.S. citizen... Before the year 1992, if you naturalized outside of Italy, elsewhere, you gave up your Italian citizenship by default. Mm. If you then had a kid after that, that child would not inherit the citizenship, so the line is broken. Got it. 
Okay. All right. So that hat rem- that citizenship remaining intact is a key yes. thing here. And so, yes. and so you have to go about proving exactly. That. And the, the nuance is that if you qualify, then you are already an Italian citizen. What the process does is it gets it recognized. You see that word? Already. You get it recognized. So uh, okay. Um, you, you are already a, an Italian you citizen. You are already an Italian citizen. You Got just don't it. have the paperwork to prove it, and you're not legal yet. Got it. Okay. All right. Very cool. It's interesting. It's it is. a weird law. And again, it's like, I try to tell people, we are so lucky to have this because not many countries have this kind of thing. I think Ireland has something similar. I'm not really up on that. Um, I think France does too, but they go up to a certain generation. And that's the other thing people ask, is there a generational limit? There is no limit. It just has to be after 1861. So right. great, 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 great is probably out. Yeah. Uh, Hungary has one, I learned recently. Uh, oh, Hungary right. has a program. Right. Yeah. And uh, they want to, I think they want to talk about it more, like they're eager to get more mm-hmm. info out there because people don't know. I mean, I didn't right. know. <laughs> yeah, there's not all the, not as much Hungarian descent in the U.S., yeah. I think. Yeah. At least not, Italian Americans are very proud of their Italian heritage, so they can't help to mention it. You know, yeah. it's like, it's like. <laughs> They do CrossFit. They just talk about it all the time. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I think it's I, I think it's funny because I, be, I believe I recall from our first interview, like you guys, you joked about that a little bit. How it was like in your in your family, like people would say stuff like about being Italian, but yeah. it's like I haven't even been. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's you, you learned. I could go on a whole other rabbit hole about this, but I've learned a lot, like about living in Italy now and grow, and it's growing up. How many times I just carelessly said. Well, I'm Italian. We're yeah. Italian. But I'd never been to Italy, didn't speak Italian, grew up in the southeast of the U.S., so pretty far removed from the Italian-American zone that my family went to in New England. Yeah. So I was even less, I even had less of a right to say it was Italian. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was about as Italian as a DiGiorno pizza, like, at best. <laughs> I've heard people do this with all kinds of uh, nationalities, though, right? They're like... You know, yeah. Oh, you know, it's because I'm Irish. I'm like, what about Jews Irish? Like, you know, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, my great, great, great grandfather came right. over and lived in Boston. But um, yeah, I live in Mississippi. And, yeah. You know, so yeah. <laughs> I love Dropkick Murphy's. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there, it, there is a big sense of pride in Italian Americans, which I think is a nice thing because you don't see it that much in other subcultures in the U.S. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, while it's easy to poke fun at them for everything that they, you know, they're sort of they kind of make themselves into caricatures of Italian and they don't really realize it but like it's coming from a good place so yeah. if you spend enough time on Instagram it's just a, or watch Jersey Shore or watch yeah. Jersey Shore <laughs> it's like you look in the comments and it's like you know Italians and Italians Americans just having it out like you're not really Italian yes we are the best Italians left Italy and all this stuff it's like <laughs> guys guys let's just you know have a pizza, New York style or Napolitano, it's fine. You know, it's all coming from a good place. I love it. I do love it, though, because there is something really uh, strong about that. This, You know, there's there's hundreds of countries in the world and nationalities and people who have, you know, come from different places. And there's probably a dozen of them that, like, you, we say, we think of when we think of these, like, subcultures that have these really, really strong ties where people say that. You know, like, my family, I'm not Italian, but... Uh, I have some um, some Swedish in me. You know, my, okay. my dad's uh, grandparents came over from Sweden. I don't think ever once in our lives we've been like, oh, that's because we're Swedish. You know, <laughs> or like, oh, we're, yeah, we're having our traditional Swedish meal tonight. Like that just hasn't popped up. And uh, and, and it's totally a normal expected thing um, when it comes to a country like, like Italy, for yes. example. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that, you know, historically and culturally and whatever. But for... for because of all those reasons we have what we have here and it's just and it is uh it's one of those places yeah it's funny and and the italians the italians bring it on themselves you know not in a bad way but like they are so idiosyncratic with all their hand gestures and the way they're so passionate about everything and how much they care about food which is good but it brings with it some quirks it's like you know they bring on some of the 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 silliness and the yeah. caricatures that come from it. <laughs> totally, totally. I've uh, I've re- I've really enjoyed that. That's been a fun part of my experience here. I'd spent a lot of time in Italy prior to this uh, several month stint that I'm doing right now, uh, but always on you know quick ish vacations. You know, yeah. a, a week or maybe two weeks or something. Like it was never like 
I'm settling in here and gonna kind of get to know the people and try to learn the language yeah. and um and and it's just been one of the more enjoyable places that I've been to um for those reasons like yeah. I mean I'm the 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 people are very warm and friendly and I obviously you know you love the the cuisine and the history um getting to know some of these off the beaten path mm. uh locations that are not your you know, stereotypical Italian destinations sure. Um, that aren't overrun with tourism. That is a that is a thing that's kind of pained me in the past in different parts of Italy, where it's like, dude, this is beautiful, but I mean, it is just like Disney World, you know. Yeah, and yeah. and uh, so getting away from that and just being in like kind of a normal place and and learning the language some and stuff. It's it's uh it's yeah it's been extremely enjoyable and like I I could I can see like La, La Dolce Vita is a is a real thing. <laughs> it's definitely a real thing. They um they are experts at just hanging yeah they hang so hard yeah (laughs) they hang hard man they uh you know something or this is a random stupid little thing like doesn't doesn't uh have any you know any importance for for the purposes of our conversation here but a really funny thing that i've noticed because i started looking for like uh midterm housing rentals Mm -hmm. like something alongside or something uh other than like a short-term airbnb um so i started looking for places to to live in and i noticed that there's almost always a sofa in the kitchen. And this was such a weird, like when I first started looking at this, I was like, this is so stupid. Like, why would I want a sofa in my kitchen? Like, uh, you know, we want like a living room to hang out in. Um, but this just became the the norm. And so I don't know if you have the actual answer to this, like why that is the case, because I've never seen that anywhere else. Well, that's like a standard. Um, but anyway, I, we came, we've, at least in our minds, we've come to realize like, cause you hang out in the kitchen a lot. Like you yeah. cook a lot of meals. There's a, like the kitchen's kind of the center of the home, not the, not the living room and the fireplace. And so anyway, I don't know. It's been a funny little thing. I think it's I've funny. Learned. I've never made note of that, but I've seen it. Yeah. And now I'm piecing, I'm thinking of in the Rolodex in my head of all the examples. It's like, yeah, that was one. That was one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's it's a true. lot of sofas. <laughs> when you said they're, they're really good at just hanging out. I, I, that came to my mind where I was like, yeah, I mean, maybe that is just because you hang out in the in the kitchen a lot. But um, no, those little idiosyncrasies about all places are just are just uh, just so fun for me. And in Spain, something I came to notice, which actually would be interesting to talk about, because I know, you know, I lived in Spain for many years. You just took a trip there. Um, but in Spain is like all about the terrace in the sun. Like everything's kind of positioned around like, yeah, we got to be on that terrace at that time because that's when the good sun is or that's when you'll have good shade or um, whatever and then like almost all the houses like it's very normal to have some kind of a terrace and that's where you spend a lot of your time um and and when i first arrived to spain i remember thinking like that's you guys talk about your terraces a lot like this is for for, me like okay yeah we got a balcony whatever but um like it's such a center like a center point of conversation and uh yeah it's just you we tend like they're small things you just this is where you hang out and and this culture that's part of it, and in other places it's different. But that's funny to the, about the terrace because you think back to the U.S. and how many, how many like attachments attachments we have in our homes that we just don't really think about, don't even appreciate. We have we have terraces or we have little patios, and it's like we have all this nice expensive lawn furniture. It's like. Yeah, we don't really sit out there. But Never. A European would look at it and be like, this is so great. Why aren't you enjoying this? <laughs> yeah, you have your front porch and then you have your, your side yard and then you have the back deck and then you have the fire pit down below and then there's the gazebo over there. You're like, right. dude, how many? Like, We have seven <laughs> sitting areas <laughs> before we even get to the actual dining room and living room. <laughs> but this is only our second home. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll be right back to the show after a quick break for a note from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you in partnership with my friends over at Lamont & Co. If you're planning a retreat, off-site, or group gathering of any kind this year, I highly suggest tapping into their extensive knowledge and experience to help you find the best possible venue for your event. I work with Kim, who has become my trusted advisor when it comes to planning any event around the world, and she's literally saved me hundreds of hours of work and has located venues I never would have found on my own. She even provides me with budget breakdowns and cost estimates for 
each location I'm interested in and negotiates contract terms on my behalf, all for free. If it sounds too good to be true, I thought the exact same thing at first, but I can assure you this is the real deal. Lamont is paid by the venues, not by you. So there's no cost, risk, or obligation here. So do yourself a favor and contact Lamont via the link in the show notes when you're planning your next group, retreat, offsite, or gathering. Before we dive back into the rest of the interview, I have a small favor to ask of the audience. If you are enjoying this episode and getting some value out of it, then please follow these very simple instructions. Step one, pick up your phone. I'll give you a second. Step two, leave a five-star review for About Abroad. That's it. (laughs) That's all I'm asking. It takes about two seconds. Of course, it is completely free to you and it is the best possible way to support myself, the show, and everyone working on About Abroad behind the scenes. The funny thing is, is that there are thousands of people tuning in to this show every single week, but we are very likely to only get a few reviews by industry standards and reviews are the most impactful way that you can show support for the show. So if you have the time, please do so. And either way, I hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. Have any of your like interests or values you feel like um, changed a lot? Like I'm, I'm thinking about houses, for example. Like you and I both owned homes mm-hmm. in America, um, sold those, moved to Europe. Uh, there were, there were certain. I'm, you know, for for me, there were things in my mind when I moved to Europe that were like non-negotiables. Like mm-hmm. I, I will, I will have a place that has these things, sure. and like years later, I don't even think about, I don't have those things and I don't think about them. Right. And, um, yeah, I don't know if anything pops into your head now. I mean, the number of rooms is definitely less important to me now. I, the house I had in the U S it was pretty modest to begin with. Mm -hmm. It was, it was a three bedroom, but it was a small three bedroom. Mm -hmm. But when I look, I mean, this is crazy. I'm almost embarrassed to say this now (laughs) being like a European, but I lived in a house by myself with three small bedrooms but it had three toilets and there was one person if there are two more toilets i think there's an equation out there that says like you know the number of toilets should not equal more than the number of people in the house i mean it's just so excessive but it was a small and you know relatively inexpensive house like that's just the norm yeah in the u.s at least in the suburbs yeah in the city obviously it's very different um, but yeah, the space is not something I need. I'm not, at least for now in my life, I'm not, I don't need a yard. Mm-hmm. You know, I, to me, the place, the home is a place to work, sleep. I like, you know, I want to have a decent kitchen cause I like to cook sometimes, but I like to be out. So I don't need, um, I don't need a lot of space. I just yeah. don't need that much space and a lot of things like a lot of clothes. My sister gave me a hard time when I went back for Christmas. She's like, Anthony, you're wearing the same three shirts and all of your pictures <laughs> so for christmas i got like this is a newer one it's like look mom and dad and sis i got different shirts finally thank you but yeah my wardrobe is so small and it's fine yeah yeah life goes on <laughs> we're doing all right uh, yeah I, what about I, you what have you noticed the the yard is definitely a thing i thought like uh because i travel with a big dog i was like okay i need um i need some sort of a yard uh, so probably a ground floor unit, mm. yard, place to keep outdoors sorts of things. Like I knew we'd be using bikes a lot. So I figured, yeah. oh, I'm going to need a garage of some sort to keep my bike in. Um, uh, I knew I was going to be giving up like having a car day to day. And that was fine. I, I was looking forward to that, actually. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, so those few things is funny. I just I remember at one point, like, um, you know, I never got any of those things living in Spain. Uh, but I remember specifically like carrying my dog and my bike down the stairs in my apartment building, like going outside <laughs> one day and just being like, at one point I thought I was, could not live in a place that would make me do any one of these things, <laughs> much less altogether. And I was like, now I do it daily and I do not think anything That's about funny. it. So That's funny. Yeah. One thing I have noticed, and it's not that my value changed, it's just that the, the the situation changed. So in the U.S., I was always thinking about because I played music. I play acoustic guitar. Uh-huh. It's a very loud style called gypsy jazz. I'm not going to get into it. But <laughs> in an apartment, people can hear on the other side of the wall, and I don't like to disturb people. So when I had a house where I wasn't sharing walls, that was great. Here, I say here in in Italy, in places with older construction, you're sharing walls, but the walls are like 
nine feet thick. Not really. Yeah. They're like two feet thick. They're just solid stone. Like you can't hear anything on the other side, so I don't have to worry about that. Uh, so that's okay. really nice. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that. I saw some uh, on your, your, you mentioned your Instagram earlier, and people will put that in the show notes too. People should definitely follow along for just to enjoy the the fun videos you put out there, but also like the very practical info about any for anybody that wants to travel to or move to Italy. Um, but I saw some images where you, pl- I think you were playing some gypsy jazz down in, uh, oh, in, in like in the streets in Spain, right? In Spain, that was awesome. I met, I met this guy from the UK who was playing that style music out. And mm-hmm. you don't really see that music out much because it's kind of niche. And I saw him, I was like, dude, I have my guitar here. I'll be here for two weeks. Let's get together. So we got together and just played out at some cafes. And that was great. It's oh. like, I just, I have to like pinch myself that <laughs> this kind of thing was possible and that now I'd be doing this. It's just incredible. I mean, the things that happen when you travel, I heard the story of, of your wife side hustling now as a, as a traffic director in Albania. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, yeah, not, not a very well paid gig, but, um, <laughs> but we made it out alive. So I guess that counts for something. <laughs> but, That's, I'm but, sure yeah. that was like a, like, what are we doing? It was. Moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was. I mean, yeah, for, we were, we were, so lost uh gps just not helping uh map not useful uh driving down a quote-unquote road that was like a dirt road but like a highway um supposedly and i'm not saying this is like all of albania this is just what we experienced in this moment and then we get to like the end of the road where it merges into a exit ramp like in the middle of the exit ramp but the exit ramp is like a straight up 90 degree turn (laughs) or 45 degree turn so we have to make like a u-turn basically onto the exit ramp off of a dirt road as traffic's like flying by (laughs) which is like what do we do (laughs) um so not quite as cool as the gypsy jazz in in southern spain but but these things do happen they make for they make for funny stories um did you enjoy your trip to spain like how like you're a lot of your uh a lot of your experience here in europe you've traveled around a lot of europe i know now but um, you know, obviously the focal point's been sure. Italy and sure. the, the, I, I think Italians say this, but I know Spanish say it all like the Italians are our cousins, you know, like where, where there's so many similarities, but there's also distinct differences, obviously the language and food and, you know, history and things like that. But there's a lot of similarities, some differences, like how did you, how do you reflect on your, your time traveling through Spain? Um, it was it was really amazing. I love Spain now. So I I went to Barcelona, Valencia, and Malaga. Mm-hmm. I, those are where I stayed. Um, and then I did you know a day trip from Barcelona to that small town I was mentioning, where my friend is and his family is from. And I got to meet his parents and their parents. And they had this like such a picturesque villa out in the countryside with this. I mean, their parents, I think, are in their early 90s, and they have this huge garden that they take care of wow. and a pool, and it's just insane. And they were they were just so sweet, and they just spoke Catalan, and I was able to speak Italian, and they could understand me, which oh, was cool, because there's a lot of similarity there. Um, so that was really cool. That was a very authentic experience that I was fortunate to have. Um, it was interesting being in the smaller town in Spain, and I asked, like, is there a local... There's one difference I noticed between Italy and Spain. So is there like a local regional food from this town? Mm. Because in Italy, most towns with more than 10,000 people have a thing. Yeah. And I didn't see that in Spain. I didn't see where like that a local thing. So I, that made me notice more like Italy, Italy is kind of different in that way where it is hyper regionalized. Um, I, I noticed something just I had such an interesting experience just the other day. We went to uh, um, one of the like little Christmas market things here in a, in a little town. Um 45 minutes from where we are now. And so we're just, you know, in this little village at their little local Christmas market and they offered like a cheese board, you know? So we're like, oh, we'll take the cheese board. And they were, you know, you have to like pick your cheeses, but we didn't understand the menu completely. So we were trying to ask like, you know, do you have something like this or like this? And, um, and my wife was trying to say like, do you have like a a soft cheese? Like, like, uh, but she used the word creamy um, you know, so, so you might think of like Brie, for example, or something like that. It's not what she meant, but it's what was interpreted. Anyway, the girl went on to explain to us that uh, that was impossible um, to have such a cheese because we're in the mountains and they don't make that kind of cheese in the mountains. And uh, so they only had, she, she went on to explain, like they only had like these 10 cheese options. 
they were all from right here in this little wow. tiny region. Um, and it was, she wasn't like, she didn't think that was strange. It was interesting for us. Cause we were like, could you imagine just, you know, being in Atlanta and, uh, you know, someone saying like, Oh yeah, sorry, we don't, we don't make that kind of cheese in Georgia. Um, so, you know, you can't, you can't get that here. <laughs> and it's just like, you know, they, there's imports there, you know, you can venture outside the area, but I, we loved it. We thought this is awesome. We're going to get like three or four cheeses just specifically from this little town. Mm-hmm. And, um, and yeah, that struck us as very interesting. Like the flip side of your experience. I did, I didn't really experience that much in Spain either, mm-hmm. but it's been a very prevalent thing here in Italy. Yeah. Even as if you look at a bottle of water that you buy in Italy, what it says is where it was packaged, it has the province in parentheses. It's usually within like an hour drive from where you are. Wow. I mean, even like the commercialized water bottle is local. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is very, it's a very big deal. The, lo- the local product, like the, yes. where it comes from is, is uh, elaborated on on the menu. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that's, uh, that's, um, that's something I'm definitely appreciating. The qua- like the quality the the way people put like an emphasis on quality and uh the locality of things yes. here is very impressive yeah. yeah and it's the same thing the food and the language are the same in that way there is the local like here where we are in the alps it's just it's italian but it's got this kind of like austrian flair to it and yep. it, it's so interesting how have you been you spent some time here how have you been doing with the language here um, so I'm taking some, I take an Italian classes. Um, so like twice a week, just for an hour, go in and just okay. meet with a teacher. And, um, I also, I've, I've shared this on the podcast before, but I love the podcast coffee break. Yeah. Um, so I've been listening to coffee break Italian. I've used it for Spanish and German and, so um, that guy's so brilliant. Mark, I think Mark, is his name. Yeah. Oh he's insanely good. Like, I don't know how the guy does it, but, um, <laughs> somehow manages to speak dozens of languages and, and, you know, articulate how to learn it, yes. um, for, for someone else. So I love, I listen to the podcast. I do a little bit of classes. Um, and then of course, like I do speak Spanish. So, um, th- there's a lot of cognates and words that sure. flow. I mean, I've, I've definitely found it easier to learn a bit of Italian because of speaking Spanish. However, I thought it would be easier. Like I thought it would come like so much more, yeah. uh, natural and, um, I'm finding like, I'm also just not good at languages. <laughs> like mm-hmm. this isn't like a, a strength of mine. I, I enjoy learning them because it's fun to be able to communicate, yeah. but it's definitely not one of those things that I just naturally get. Right. Um, right. so anyway, thought it'd be a little bit easier than it has been. Um, but, uh, but I'm able to get by like yeah. for anybody that, you know, I, for anybody that has a fear of traveling in Italy because of the language barrier, I, I think there's, you can go to a lot of places where it's a lot harder. Like um, I think people are generally warm, welcoming, easy, yeah. uh, even if they don't speak English, which often someone does speak a bit of English, mm-hmm. um, then, you know, and I, th- I would say more so than in Spain. Um, okay. that's I've been, that's been thing. my experience. Like you get more English here, uh, than, than in Spain. So yeah, it's like I, language hasn't been a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And it's such a fun ride to learn a language yeah. and be somewhere. I mean, I've learned to traveling now is. I get such a rush out of when you are actively learning a language to go to a town where you're the only person that speaks English in my case and just making your way and just trying to talk to locals and you just you go to a bar where people are a little warmed up and you just start talking to somebody and it's so much fun. So it just fun. I didn't realize the the unlock that it would have in my life. I wish I had started when I was younger. I, like I'm not really a language person either. Yep. I feel like I am now, not that I have a gift for it. I just really love it. But it's just to, to immerse yourself that way, even if I'm, I'm not perfect at Italian, yeah. you know, I'm not native. Um, and they can tell right away because the pronunciation in Italian is so precise Yeah, that they just, they can tell, <laughs> they know, but they appreciate it. And if, especially if you're in a smaller town, they appreciate like, what is this American doing here? A, why are you in this town? Yeah. And they're like, our town is a dump. They don't say that. Yeah. Like, why would you come here and not somewhere else? And then if you speak Italian, they just love it. And then they want to hear your story. Like, what are you doing? Um, it sounds really egotistical now that I spill it all. Like, That's so interesting. And all the locals should know it. <laughs> don't you guys want to talk to me and know my story? Wait a minute, come back. <laughs> so, so, something you just said, though, is really, really interesting to me. It was, you said, you know, people... I'm sure people have actually said on some level what you just uh, said that they said, which is like, you know, why are you here? 
I get it. I get that so much. Mm-hmm. You know, I think especially when you get out of the the Venice and the Florence and the Romes of the of the country, like you get into some of these just more normal places where people are living. I've heard that so many like, why are you here? Like, what what is your like? Why Italy? And then they kind of like uh, poo poo Italy a little yeah. bit. Like, oh yeah, well, yeah. no, I I say like, yeah, I've been living in Spain. I'm I'm here for some time. Oh, I'd go back to Spain, and you're like really great here like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you know what the source of that is or have you I've, oh. I had one person tell me like Italians just love to complain about their country so they so they do and I've and I've had more in-depth conversations with people kind of like uh, Italians kind of like sharing their frustrations about Italy and there, there's some political stuff there there's yeah. some economic stuff um, but you know just as a place to come spend some time I'm like I don't know man it's pretty sweet like <laughs> it, it's yeah, I do know the source. Well, I think I know the source of that. And I get that all the time is, why are you here? And in fact, the, the maybe I mentioned this the last time I was on, but the, when I arrived in Italy, when I moved here, and I had my guitar and my big suitcase and my backpack, I got off at the train station in this little town. And first thing, the police pulled up and they, you know, they asked for my documents because that's common here. They ask, like, you know, they want to see your tourist documents right here. Yep. And so I showed her my passport, and they said, well, "Why are you here?" And I said, "I'm here. Um, I'm moving here." First, they thought I was coming to work because they're like, "Oh, yeah, we could tell like you're coming to work here. Do you have a right to work here, etc." And I said, "Oh, I'm here. I'm moving here to to live here. I'm applying for my Italian citizenship." And like a flip, just a switch just flipped because they were like, "Oh." Why don't you give us your U.S. citizenship and we'll give you our Italian citizenship? <laughs> I have an idea. <laughs> yeah. Fair trade. So that, yeah, that's very common. It's like, like just yesterday I was on the market here and I met these two girls from here. Uh, one was now living in Portugal and one is living in Spain for okay. work. Because the economic opportunities in Italy are really poor. Yeah. It's for, for like people our age. I mean, just people in general, it's very hard to find work. Um, so people are moving away, which is why there's all these, you know, tax incentives for people to come. Um, yeah, the state of affairs with the economy here is not good. So I don't really blame them. But yes, also, sorry, Italians do like to complain a lot. Yeah. So I think part of it is that. But it's rightfully so. So that also has humbled me a bit. Mm-hmm. It's easy to show up to Italy as a foreigner and say, life here is great. Everything here is so cheap. It's like, well, it's cheap for us. Right. Yeah. It's yeah, normal yeah. for you them. You have to be careful with that. Yeah. You do have to be careful with that. And I try not to lean too much into that, especially on social media. You see lots of like, come to Italy where everything is this, this, this. Like, why isn't the U.S. this way? It's like, well, because people in the U.S. make more money. Yeah. If they started selling coffee for a dollar in the U.S., the stores would go out of business. It's right. Not that, <laughs> it's like, it's so much more complicated. And then with the citizenship as well. You know, I, I'm here. I'm able to be here because I'm a citizen. And that was one of my reasons for being here. So that naturally comes up. But you meet a lot of immigrants in Italy who were brought here like as kids, mm-hmm. like from Albania, especially. There's a lot of Albanians here and Africans as well. But Albanians, especially to the untrained eye, or the untrained ear, you would show up and think like this person's Italian. Yeah. And you hear their story and like, oh, no, I was brought here when I was a kid. I'm Al- Albanian. And they're not citizens. Yep. Because they weren't born, luckily, with like you are with Italian ancestry. And mm-hmm. like these people speak fluent Italian. They have, you look at them. They've lived here for 40 years. They're so. effectively Italians. Like they're more Italian than any Italian American that I've ever met. But they're not lucky enough to have the ancestry. So I do try to be careful with that, which is like a balance because like, I have a business trying to get people get to get their passports. So I post pictures of me with my two passports. Yep. But I also don't like try to wave it in the face of these people, which I guess I am with Instagram. But yeah, it's a balance because yeah. you do want to appreciate that. One hundred percent. Yeah, that's a it's a fine line. I mean, I've I, I guess I've like I mentioned this sometimes on this show because I guess there's always like a slight level of of guilt associated with the privilege that mm-hmm. um, you just can't help but feel it a little bit where you're like. Yeah, it's great to talk about these, you know, the you play in gypsy jazz in the south of Spain and us live in the Dolce Vita here in the in yeah. here in Italy right now, but you recognize that not everyone has those opportunities, not you know, not not just the people that are living here and, and don't have the same economic opportunities, but people around the world who perhaps don't have access to any work or remote work or um, yeah. you know, the opera just like their home life situation doesn't give them the chance mm-hmm. to do this. So um that that's always like 
prevalent in my mind. And I'm, I'm always a bit unsure how to balance sharing that, hey, this is possible and you could have such a life, but also recognizing, unfortunately, it's not going to be for everyone. And there are going to be those that have the opportunity and those that don't. Mm-hmm. And, and so finding that balance is, is tricky and admittedly like something on my mind um, you know, whenever we have these conversations. Right, right. And you, you've you been to more countries than I have. And like, for example, I always go back to Albania. I think the median income out in Albania is like 13% what it is in the U.S. Wow. And you've been to Albania. Did you feel, you're traveling around and going to places, did you feel, like, did you feel that disparity? Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, it there and in, in a lot of countries, um, I have I have definitely felt like it would be easy without the self realization uh, the you know the, the part of the conversation we're having right now without that being uh, there on your mind it would be easy to fall into the trap of um, without even attempting to flaunting that yeah um, you know and and just like very basic decisions that you make in a day to day where you eat where you're going to live. Um, you know, paying for the extra service that, you know, you just, you, because you don't have to think about it because oh, it's two bucks or five bucks or whatever. Um, it would be very easy to fall into that trap. And I remember just like <laughs> early on when I was first looking into long-term travel and li- living abroad and stuff like the first people, um, you know, the algorithms work the way they work. Uh, the first people that pop up are often those people flaunting those kinds of things and are getting lots of clicks and stuff. And I remember just immediately being disgusted by it. Like, yeah. I, well, I never want to be that guy. Right. And in my first, um, I, I moved to Ecuador for six months oh. early on in my like transition to this type of lifestyle. And I met a lot, unfortunately met like a lot of people that fell into that trap. I'll never forget like in particular a guy um, telling me like, you know, someone said, yeah, I mean here, you know, you can have lunch for, for five bucks. And, uh, and this guy, you know, a, a foreigner, um, saying, you know, oh yeah, well, if you want to eat like an Ecuadorian, you can eat for five bucks, but who wants to do that? Like super rude, like very wow. distasteful comments. And you're like, man, man, like, you know, yeah. You, why, why'd you come to Ecuador just to live cheap like I don't understand like what, there's so much more to the richness of the culture here and yeah. um and so much more to appreciate so anyway I've always been like very put off by yeah. by that and and but definitely as yeah to answer your question 100% have seen that hmm. that's that's heartbreaking why would somebody have that attitude I know but yeah it, it is, it's an easy trap to fall into especially now with social media and you're just moving quick posting stuff making content it's like well, okay yeah have some awareness what has been i'm curious so you've been you've been doing the abroad game for a lot longer than me the expat life what has been what has not messed up to your expectations from Mm. when you started this for better or worse awesome question um i uh i think i you know I, i knew that moving away from like friends and family would be the challenging part but as i've gotten older that has become even harder. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think we just for, you know, we evolve over time or whatever. And, um, for me over the years, that part has become a lot more challenging. Mm. I really want to maintain my connections with my true friends, my, my circle of friends, you know, my, your parents get older, you want to spend more time with them. You want to go, you want to be there with them through the challenging times. Your, your best friends have kids and you're not there for their, Mm -hmm graduations or their birthdays or whatever. Um, and that stuff, I think when I was first setting off on this adventure, it was just about the adventure and the fun and yeah. all the, the little experiences day to day were awesome enough to make me be like, yeah, well that's, I'll, I'll get, I'll circle back to all those things that are important to me, but they're just not the priority now. And, and over time that's shifted and being away from those things has become harder. So I think that's what really hasn't like matched my expectation that I thought maybe I would get over that. And it's been the inverse in a way. Interesting. I definitely feel that. I mean, even just a week ago, leaving, I was in the U S for two months for the holidays and I've gone back a few times while I've been living in Italy and leaving was like, hi, I love the U S but I can't wait to get back this time. I don't know what changed, but it was like, it was hard to leave. Yeah. It's like, man, my family and, and I kind of like broke down the day. If they're listening, they're gonna be like, "Why are you bringing this up, Anthony?" <laughs> but I did like the day before I left because it's like 
their support that for me and going and doing this 180 in my life and and having this trajectory is totally different than what I was doing before. And their support has just been incredible. And like you yeah. know, now my sister comes out and she loves Italy, which is really cool. And my dad's been out and he's going to come out again. Um, so it's it's been really great. But yeah, you can't. I've learned that you can't replace home connections. Yeah, home like deep roots. It's like I. It's like, yeah, when I set off, it was like the adventure. You're just high on the adventure. You ignore everything. All it's like, I can't wait to tell everybody all this. This is all I'm thinking about. And then the first time I went back to the U.S., we went to this local, you know, regular Mexican restaurant near my parents' house. And it was like, not any flashy place. There's like basic Mexican food, but like we're there. And just by chance, we just run into all these family neighbors. Yeah. Like, oh, Anthony, it's so good to see you. And it was just like wow like these are my people is, this is home <laughs> and you see that traveling around italy i now have more of an appreciation for when i go to smaller towns and see locals together and they're really bonding and i feel like you know why don't they let me in why don't they why can't i be more part of this i mean part of its language which we could get to if we have time but it's like these people grew up together and yeah. this is their thing and they're going to be friendly and warm but you know you have this elsewhere so I have more of appreciation for that now. Yeah, that's that's well put. I I could say just say ditto to that because um had that same reflection upon leaving home recently and also realizing that when I when I see that here mm-hmm. um and uh and and recognizing like it's tough to have one without the other. Like you you have those close roots and circles back home and like that also has to exist here for abroad for for yeah. the locals here. Um yeah. and I think the other thing that has not like matched expectations is I didn't realize uh, how like almost perpetual the 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 need to consistently be doing like bureaucratic stuff is going to be visa paperwork and like that stuff's just like, uh, you know, not just visas, but, you know, you get into like doing visa stuff taxes in multiple countries, um, figuring out, you know, I wanted to figure out, Hey, we were looking at buying a house in, in Spain. Um, okay. Now I got to go through like the mortgage process in Spanish and in, you know, in a foreign country. And, uh, you know, if you're looking at how, what if you move from this country to that? Okay. What is the stuff you have to go through? We've evaluated, you know, moving to different countries, a lot of that stuff you have to start, you know, six months, a year before it, it gets go so it's like as soon as you finish one process you're kind of starting another mm. now admittedly that has been by my own doing a lot it's it's, <laughs> it's chasing adventure or chasing sure. change or you know we you did know, ask yeah. for all of this yeah yeah so like i'm not really <laughs> complaining i just didn't know i thought kind of like uh <laughs> i had a friend say to me they're like i thought when i graduated from college that like i would never have to like take another test again like i could kind of stop learning you know mm. i just I did the learning and now I got my job and now I make my money and that's how it works. Um, and, I, and I thought, uh, that's kind of how I thought it was with the moving abroad thing. Like, yeah. okay, I'll get my visa and then I'm there. Right. And then I can just like chill out and enjoy it. Um, but that, that stuff is, is sort of perpetual, um, and comes with being a foreigner. It's also given me a ton of empathy for people, you know, like growing, you and I grew up in the U S we have a lot of people from, um, from third countries that have come to live there in the U.S. and they have to battle this stuff yeah. in English and uh, and you know not speaking the language often and fighting much a much uh, steeper uphill battle mm. than you or I have. Yeah. So yeah, that's th- th- those are two things that really jump out at me. Did you find that with spending so much time in Spain? And now some more in Italy with the language. Have you guys been able to connect well? Because for, I guess what I'm saying is, yes, I speak Italian. I learned a little bit before I had a head start. Um, so I can talk to strangers. I have friends with, with, with him. I only speak Italian. But I have found that it's like I can't have conversations at this depth yeah. that we're having right now. Yeah, yeah. And that I miss a lot whenever I have it. I'm like, oh, wow, this is, you know, this is great. And you do miss out on that. And it kind of. How, have you experienced the same thing? Because you spent totally. more time in Spain than I have in Italy, so you maybe yeah. asked that. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned the like I have friends that I only speak in Italian with. Like that's how when people ask like, "What's your level of Spanish?" I'm like, I have, I don't know where what it is technically, but like yeah, I have I Spanish friends that don't speak English, and we have like real in depth conversations. But 100, percent they have a cap on them. Like yeah. I can't. Uh, the big thing I think is like humor 
and um, you like like sarcasm and jokes and and things like that. Like you just don't have the right way to express it. So you're missing a big part of your personality. Yes. And um, and I am obviously very funny. Clearly. So <laughs> I've been, like, I've been, people can't tell, but I've been on the floor this whole time. Yeah, just, just laughing. laughing so <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean that that so that's a big thing for me. I feel like is um is. You know, you d- you definitely miss out on that. You miss a piece of your personality, and um, I have like in in Valencia, for example, I have a, a group of guys that will get together a few times a month, and um, but some of them don't speak any English. So when a lot of them do, a couple of them are Americans, mm-hmm. and so when we're all speaking in Spanish, but when like for example the uh, Spanish guys step away for a minute, then we can just switch to English, and it's like it is so much easier to like really be myself. Yep. Um, and it's like, it's like, you know, driving with the, the e-brake just like slightly on or yeah, something. That's like, a great way to put it. It's can't like, get up to full speed. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, they say like laughter is the best, the best medicine. Mm-hmm. If you go long enough without getting that, the full experience of that with other people, I wonder what that could do to somebody. Yeah, because it changes you. It's just not laughter is so much a part of our dialogue, and to not totally be able to have that with somebody, it's tough. But man, I I still get it's still a high when I can talk to Italian people or just like sit at a table with Italians and just listen to them because it's so. I mean, it's like a song. And it's yeah. Like, wow, they don't speak any. They speak so much differently here than where I live in Central Italy. And it's like it's a never ending. Every time. Honestly, I think that's one of my biggest appeals of Italy. It's like when I'm back and I hear that, I'm like, ah, "Yeah, this is great." Totally. I I don't speak Italian, and I feel that about yeah, Italian. You, you don't know, need to... just seeing the way that they're interacting together and the way the language flows, and being able to pick up on some words and maybe piece together what they're saying. But I'm like, I'm like, man, I I I love the flow mm. of life and uh, yeah. that they've got here. So. You picked a good place to live, man. I think um, I know we could go for probably go on for for hours about all this, but we covered good stuff about citizenship by descent. I think we also talked about some of the uh, the highs and lows of of life abroad, which is yeah. good to shed some light on the on the lows, the what not to do or what to be aware of, at least. And um, and you know, just good to catch up with you and, yeah. and here. I'm so glad that things worked out, you know, and that obviously we could meet up and and hang out here in person together today, but also that like you know this. You set off on this journey and it, it took you in the right path. And, and now you're helping others follow in your footsteps, which is just super cool. Yeah. Um, so makes me really happy to, to yeah. see where it's led you to. I appreciate that. Yeah, that, that, that really means a lot coming from you because you took the leap a while ago. And there's one if there's one thing I could say to people is like, you know, I still haven't figured all this out. I'm still, you know, every, it's always a journey. But like in terms of just taking a leap. I made a reel a few months ago where it's like about like taking a leap on Instagram and whether that's like moving abroad or like starting a relationship, editing a relationship, getting a new job or something like I want to, I love seeing people like do something kind of risky. And now after you've done this, after I've done this, I feel like I have more of a tolerance for risk. And mm. it's like, you know, there's always that thing you wanted for years. that's bubbling up in your head. I love to see people just do it. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, somebody that if they're in a job that they've been at for five, 10 years and they're just comfortable and you know, they have the money totally. to quit. And if they quit, they would have time to jump into something else, but they just don't. It's like, come on, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> you need that push. Just do the push. Just like take the leap. Cause it's like, what's the worst that could happen? If you're, if you come from any level of privilege, just like, just do it. Yep. Start that company, whatever it is, like go for it, you know? 100%. Yeah. I've, I've, I've met very few people on this whole journey um, that took that leap and regretted taking the leap. Like even the ones where it went kind of badly, like, Mm -hmm. you know, this figured out this wasn't for me, uh, whatever the case may be, uh, lost some money, um, you know, whatever. Pretty much within a very short period of time, they're like back on their feet, back in the same position as they were in when they left. And uh, if you're, if you're smart about it and, you know, plan a little bit ahead, um, I think like you, if you have that itch, you owe it to yourself to scratch it. That's the, yeah. that's the, uh, the way that I, I tend to think about it. So, um, yeah, man, we, we are aligned on that and, uh, really, really enjoyed this. It's good catching yeah, up with this you. This was great. This yeah. was great. I appreciate uh, it. If anybody has questions about the citizenship stuff or wants help planning their Italy trip, I do one-on-one video consultations for people who want like direct help on like where to go and stuff. So. 
feel free to reach out. Do you have the one place, do you have a place in mind in Italy that's like, uh, like up and coming? Like where, where do you recommend people come Ooh. if they're like, Hey, I've, I've, uh, I want to make a trip to Italy. I don't want to do Rome and Venice and Florence. Sure. Um, what do you, what do you recommend? Um, you've been to all 20 regions, which most people have not. So yeah, most <laughs> you've seen a lot. Been, <laughs> um, I've met a couple, um, one, a, a bigger city, which people go to, but it's not the first on the list is Palermo, the capital uh, of yeah. Sicily. I love that. It's, it's, it's crazy and dirty and loud, but it's just, <laughs> it's like another world. It's kind of like Naples. I felt, sorry, Naples. I felt a little bit more warmth than welcome in Palermo, mm-hmm. um, but that's definitely not off the beaten path. Trieste up here in the north, kind of uh, in yeah. Venice, right on the border with Croatia. I love that city. Probably the cleanest Italian city I've ever been to. Wow. Really friendly people. Um, in terms of like a smaller town, I live in Umbria, which is just full of a bunch of tiny, awesome little mountain villages. Um, if people are looking for a place to live in Italy, where I live right now is not the most picturesque, but it's called Foligno. It's such a very comfortable, functional city. It's flat. It's bike friendly. It's walkable. Really awesome. Cool. Um, it's very Italian. It's proper <laughs> Italian. And then uh, nearby is a little village called Spello, S-P-E-L-L-O. I definitely recommend people visit that, especially if they're passing through by train. Mm. Um, that's one of the most charming little places I've ever seen. They do like a flower festival every summer. It's really nice. Oh, nice. I hear Bologna is an, kind of an up-and-coming place. I've, I've visited once. I haven't spent a bunch of time there. Um, seems like a cool little university city, but uh, would, you, would you add that to a... I know it's not an unheard-of place, but I mean, is it a... Would you would you agree that it's sort of an up and coming destination? I think so because again, it's like tier two, tier three vacation, meaning people don't go on their first time to Italy; they go the second or third. Yep. And I don't know anybody who's been disappointed. Obviously, it's it's they call it the food capital of the world for a reason. Yep. Which you know to say that about somewhere in Italy is like even amongst Italians, yeah. they're like, oh, you got to go to Bologna yes, for good yes. whatever. <laughs> and and. It's a big enough city. You're you're not going to be stuck with Italian. I had I went to this Ethiopian place in Bologna, amazing. Wow! I don't know if you've had Ethiopian food, yeah, I love it a couple times, but oh, it's so good. Um, so there's a lot there. There's you know there's expats, there's there's immigrants, so there's a whole scene there. It's it's lively, um, but it's all walkable. It's flat. It's it's you know it's got its share of bigger city grime. I'll uh-huh. say. And some like the commercial districts, but I highly recommend it. And then you got easy day trips to Parma and more than on Ferrara and then uh, Ravenna. And then it's got, you know, Emilia Romana and you can go to the coast to like Rimini and Riccione. Well, so, yeah. That's actually, that brings up a point. One of the things that stuck in my head about Bologna is I heard that it's the center of the Italian rail system. Um, so like all the trains yeah. pass through. So it's like. You could, I think from Bologna, you could be in Florence in like 35, 45 minutes. Yeah. You could be in Venice in less than an hour. You can be in Milan in like two hours. Yeah. You'd be up here in the Dolomites in two and a half hours. Yeah. Um, so you're like... Yeah, I know somebody who lives in Bologna that did a day trip to where we currently are. Wow. So. <laughs> that's <laughs> wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. And I'll mention another place that's, that, you know, exploring some of this like northern, when you picture Italy on a map, like sort of the hip of the boot, I guess, mm-hmm. like up at the, the top of the country. Um, but Verona is a really pretty little city that's, um, that what I think is cool about Verona is that you, you know, it's like, it's classically Italian looking, uh, architecturally. They say it has the most Osterias per capita. So like, it's got this like Osteria, like Italian pub vibe. Mm. Um, and it's 30 minutes from Lake Garda, which to me is like, maybe one of the most beautiful places in the world love the whole region around lake garda and then that means you're like an hour into the dolomites yeah um so it feels like you're in this like classically mediterranean italian city yeah. but you're like right at the foothills of some of the most beautiful mountains in the world yeah. and it's not too big but it's not too small it's got a lot going on so anyway it's a it's a another cool place that i've yeah. enjoyed and exploring did a, just a day trip there with my sister a few months ago and we we were like we should have stayed here yeah and done the day trip to where we were staying because <laughs> verona was so nice and there's the big river there and then you can take a lift up to the top yeah 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 man now you're making me want to move to northern italy what am I doing? <laughs> luckily you're not that far away i mean uh we've got we day trips abound so 
Um, all right, man, I know I got to let you go. This was That was a fun little cap to throw on the end of an already awesome conversation. So grazie mille. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to continuing to follow the journey. It's been yes. fun to watch. Thanks, Chase. Congrats on your success. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for tuning in today from wherever you are in the world. Once again, I'm Chase, and this has been another episode of About Abroad. For those of you wondering how you can best support the show, I have made it super simple for you. Just go over to the show notes of the episode that you just finished listening to and click on one of the two following links. Aboutabroad.com slash newsletter to get our monthly newsletter. No spam, guaranteed. Or ratethispodcast.com slash aboutabroad where you can quickly and easily leave a review for the show. It's not just important to me. It also helps more wanderers just like you find us. Finally, don't forget to subscribe on your podcast platform of choice, and we will see you again next week. Thanks again. Hasta luego, amigos.